Good afternoon. Thank you all for venturing out in this uh, terrible weather that has canceled our classes for the afternoon. Uh, welcome to this uh, afternoon session of the Barnes Symposium. I suspect most of you have already uh, been introduced to uh, Dr. Fred Van Dyke, and he's speaking uh, this afternoon on practicing conservation, the faith tradition of serving and protecting creation. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for taking the risk of coming. They might end up calling this the lecture of no return, uh, but we'll, we'll see how it turns out. Pardon me for just a moment. I haven't used your computer here before but it seems to be working a lot like mine. Uh, we are. Uh, okay, thank you again for having me. It's been a pleasure and an honor to be with you today. I've really enjoyed your campus and all the people I've been meeting. Let me begin with a confessional story about myself. Many years ago, as a younger scholar than I am now, I found myself leading one of those uh, current issue commissions in the ASA, the American Scientific Affiliation, and the one I found myself heading up was called the Global Resources and Environment Commission, or affectionately known as GRAIC. If only we had changed the last two letters around, we would have had a more biblical and more pleasant acronym. But on GRAKE and on our work there, we discovered that despite many efforts to address the need, it still seemed that Christians in science and out didn't really know what the Bible said about caring for the earth. And our human effort to speak to that was to write a book. It was called Redeeming Creation. Redeeming Creation was an effort to answer that question, which we thought was a very important question, what does the Bible say about caring for the earth? I still think that's an important question. But I've come to the place in life today that I think it is not necessarily the best question, it's not necessarily an effective question to start a conversation with a non-Christian about caring for the earth. It's the wrong question for people who never read the Bible. But many people who never read the Bible are still doing and accomplishing wonderful things in conservation. I admire and respect these people. I know many of them. I want to broaden the conversation to include them. Now there are many other important questions to conservationists today that are very good questions and the Bible addresses very directly. I addressed some of them in the chapel this morning and I want to very briefly review those with you here. Those four big questions that are of importance to conservationists who are actually doing conservation are these. What is the basis of nature's value? Do human beings have the capacity to protect that value? If they do have the capacity, do they have the authority to protect it? What gives human beings the right to manage nature? And finally, what is the end of nature, the goal, the best outcome of nature? And does our conservation activity make any sense in light of that? Now, when people are practicing something as part of their life and work, they really want more than didactic intellectual answers. They want to see some answers. Kyle Van Houten, who himself is an unusual hybrid of conservation biologist and environmental ethicist and theologian, put it very well. He said, is nature conservation a virtue or is it just good science? If conservation is a virtue, then scientific arguments alone are insufficient. And the battle visibly involves social traditions as well as science. So asking why should we care about conservation is not the right question. The question is, does the tradition 
does any tradition have regard for conservation? And more specifically, what ethical tradition regards conservation as an ethical practice? Or more simply, is there a tradition that practices conservation? Now reading Kyle's work and from time to time talking with Kyle, that was a question that became more and more interesting and more and more important to me. And that is a question that I want to answer this afternoon. It's really the question I've tried to answer in my newer book, Between Heaven and Earth, a history of conservation in the Christian church. A monk went for a walk around his monastery where he lived, and standing on a hill overlooking the landscape, he saw the river that meandered near the monastery. He considered how it nourished the fish and watered the crops and fed a nearby lake. When he returned from his walk, he had the leisure and the solitude to write about these things. But as he wrote, he found himself not merely describing the river or the conditions the river produced, but feeling a sense of profound gratitude toward God, not only to God, but to the river itself. And so the monk knew then, as people know now, that if you want to be grateful for your blessings, it's wise to count them. So he began to list, as he wrote, all of the services provided by the stream and all the good that the stream did. And he found himself describing the stream with adjectives like friendly, faithful, kindly. He ended by saying that he thought it right to list all these benefits that the stream provided in order, in his own words, for the purpose of giving thanks due it. Now what I have described really happened in the 12th century AD, a Cistercian monk of the Order of St. Benedict was the one who wrote these words. He was an ordinary monk. He was never made a saint, never canonized. I used him as my first example to make the point that this sort of thinking was actually quite ordinary in the Christian church and in its history, although it came to be expressed not only by ordinary men and ordinary women in the church, but by extraordinary ones as well. Leaders who gave insights to others, who had gained those insights from diligent study and from the inspiration of the Word of God. If you look for writings in the early church that address an environmental crisis, you're not going to find any because they didn't know they had one. But they should not be labeled as ignorant on that score because neither did anybody else. Nobody wrote about an environmental crisis then. But if you look at what the early church was teaching about the physical world, you do see the philosophical and the intellectual foundations for the care of the earth being formed in their thinking. It began with an unshakable conviction that God is the author and maker of the universe and everything in it, and that therefore this matter in which women and men live, and in Paul's words, move and have their being, was real. The world was really there. It was not an illusion. And to make this picture a little less illusionary, this is a very close up, very masterful shot by um, a colleague I know, a nature photographer named John Hess. And what you're looking at here is eelgrass, an aquatic plant with a river current flowing over it. The world was not an illusion, not a shadow of something else that it represented. It was present and it was real. Thus, this hard, high view of matter was never very far from religious contemplation. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. The opening words of the Apostles' Creed one of the earliest creedal documents of the church. And there it is leaping out at us, this dignity, this reality, the significance of the natural world. St. John of Damascus 
affirmed this view when he wrote, I do not worship matter. He wanted to clear that up. I worship the creator of matter who became matter for my sake, who willed to take his abode in matter, who worked out my salvation through matter. Never will I cease honoring the matter that wrought my salvation. I honor it, but not as God. Because of this, I salute all remaining matter with reverence, because God has filled it with his grace and power. Through it, my salvation has come to me. Now, this view of the dignity of matter, of the physical world, led the church to appreciate that its maker had his own purposes in making it. Many of them were unscrutable, too inscrutable to the human mind, and far above any understanding of practical human use. And out of this view, the majority of the early church patriarchs rejected a utilitarian view of the world, that the world had been made only for the use and enjoyment of man. Augustine explained this with an analogy and not a little bit of humor. If an unskilled person, he wrote, enters the workshop of an artificer, he sees in it many appliances of which he does not understand the use and which, if he is a foolish fellow, he considers unnecessary. Moreover, should he carelessly fall into the fire or wound himself with a sharp-edged tool, he is under the impression that many of these things there are hurtful, whereas the craftsman, knowing their use, laughs at his folly. Now he makes the application clear. And thus some people presume to find fault with many things in this world through not seeing the reason for their existence, for though not required for the furnishing of our house, these things are necessary for the perfection of the universe. But the question arises, did God merely make matter or does God also love matter? And does he love the life of this material world within it and arising from it? Again, the patriarchs taught that because we share a common creator with them, humans ought to look upon other kinds of life, and especially the lives of animals, with compassion, to see and to understand them as our brothers. And because God made many things that, in Augustine's words, were necessary for the perfection of the universe, but not, in a utilitarian sense, for the furnishing of our house, these non-human creatures rightly pursued their proper ends of their own and they ought to do so. In other words, the Christian church was one of the first intellectual traditions to understand and to teach a rational basis for the intrinsic value of nature in general and of non-human life in particular. The complementary doctrines of perceiving a bond with all created things through a common creator and at the same time respecting the unique non-human-centered purposes for which God made that life made it natural for church leaders to offer with their congregants prayers for the welfare of animals. Basil the Great, Bishop of Caesarea, contemporary of Augustine, is credited with doing so. At one point in his writings, he leads his flock to pray, thus enlarge us with the sense of fellowship of all living things our brothers, the animals, to whom thou gavest the earth as their home in common with us. We remember with shame that in the past we have exercised the high dominion of man with ruthless cruelty, so that the voice of the earth, which should have gone up to thee in song, has been a groan of travail. You hear the words of Romans 8 echoed there in his prayer. May we realize that they live not for us alone, but for themselves and for thee, and that they love the sweetness of life even as we, and serve thee better in their place than we in ours. It's a very repentant prayer. But does God, in fact, love this non-human life that he has made? 
And an equally important question, why did he make so much of it? The church didn't think these were trivial questions. They considered them worthy of thoughtful answers. Their finest and foremost scholars took them up, like Thomas Aquinas. Regarding the question of whether God loves all things, Aquinas wrote, God loves all existing things. He begins with that declaration. For all existing things, insofar as they exist, are good, since the existence of a thing is itself a good. And likewise, whatever perfection it possesses. Now, it has been shown above, and he refers here to his earlier answer to an important question, that God's will is the cause of all things. It must needs be, therefore, that a thing has existence or any kind of good only inasmuch as it is willed by God. To every existing thing, then, God wills some good. Hence, since to love anything is nothing else than to will good to that thing. Note how he understands love is an action, not a feeling. It is manifest that God loves everything that exists. Well, as they say, that settles that. And in demonstrating logically that God does love all existing things because he wills good to every living thing, Aquinas laid yet one more plank in the foundation for the argument of the intrinsic value of non-human creatures. Now this kind of thinking gave Christians, if they were paying attention, a myriad of reasons for treating the natural world around them with reverence and respect. So the question for the Christian tradition must now be, given that the tradition has made an argument for moral value, does it also make and more importantly, does it also demonstrate an argument and an understanding of moral agency, of correct moral engagement with nature? By the Middle Ages, the church had begun to practice what were called rogation days, observed for three days before Ascension Day, 40 days after Easter. During these three days, the priest would go about the fields of landowners and among the peasants, and they would bless the land and its harvest and pray for its bounty. In all these things, the monks and the people that they served looked upon the earth as a creation of God and on that creation as a gift of God. Now, there are scholars who have tried to depict the church as an agent teaching the exercise of domination and subjugation. And there were no doubt examples of this in particular cases, but as a generic argument, this line of reasoning is a complete failure. It's very similar, generically, to something that G.K. Chesterton said about refuting a different but similar charge against Christianity. The charge, Chesterton said, that Christianity is a dark and cruel religion which suffocates art and life from its adherence would be a powerful argument against it. The only problem is this charge is not true. In one of the most famous attacks on Christianity and its responsibility for the ecologic crisis, the UCLA historian, Lynn White Jr., attempted, among other things, to use medieval calendar art to show that Christianity was leading people to view the world as a place to be mastered and subdued. He wrote in his essay, The Historical Roots of Our Ecologic Crisis, in older calendars before 830 AD, the months were shown as passive personifications. The new Frankish calendars, which set the style for the Middle Ages, are very different. They show men coercing the world around them, plowing, harvesting, butchering pigs, Man and nature are two things, and man is master. And he included among these dominating activities things like gathering acorns and sawing wood. Now, the passive personifications that White refers to here were typically Greek or Roman gods and goddesses, such as the Roman deity Janus, the god of beginnings and endings, was associated with the month of January, 
The reason these minor deities ceased to be portrayed on calendars was because no one believed in them anymore. Freed from the superstitions and the fears of animism, people no longer feared nature. Guided by the church's teaching, they saw nature as a real and good gift of God, and in that understanding, they saw joy and dignity in their own labors in it. So to suggest that slaughtering pigs or gathering acorns represent humans coercing the world around them is simply silly. If those were our criteria for environmental coercion, every civilization on the planet, even the most primitive, would be judged to be engaged in ruthless exploitation of the natural world. The Church of Jesus Christ taught no such doctrine. In fact, when we look at scholarly research on Bible commentaries that were written then, Bible commentaries on such passages as Genesis 128, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, the commentators almost never show any interest in learning how to dominate the earth. They write instead about trying to understand God's covenant with mankind, or sometimes about the implications of human sexuality to fill the earth. I could tell you many more stories like this, but they're old stories, and modern people want to hear new modern stories. Perhaps the newest, the most arresting story of the past 10 years in conservation has been the rise of a new organizational animal, the Conservation FBO, the Conservation Faith-Based Organization. Christianity can't claim exclusive rights to these. We have Jewish Conservation FBOs, Hindu Conservation FBOs, Muslim Conservation FBOs. Some of them with very memorable acronyms. My personal favorite is the African Muslim Environmental Network, or AMEN. But the leading and most effective conservation FBOs that have arisen in the last 10 years are Christian FBOs, like Arasha, a Christian conservation organization that's now active in 19 countries worldwide. It's the only faith-based organization that holds membership in the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And again, to tell a confessional story about myself and my own ignorance, I was once, as a younger scholar, under the impression that I could join the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. So being very direct, I called them up. And I said, I'd, I'd like to join IUCN. The person on the other end of the line had a long period of silence, and then she said, Dr. Van Dyke, the only permitted members of IUCN are countries or conservation organizations. You are neither. And I said, yes, you're right. I beg your pardon. Arasha, however, is there not because the IUCN wants some token Christian presence for spiritual diversity, but because they respect their work and the things they have accomplished. Now, the scholar who explored the question of what FBOs do and why they are successful in the greatest depth has been Aletha Abiyuan of the University of Southern California. Abiyuan has been able to identify consistent trends and differences in conservation strategy and practice between these two camps, the secular conservation NGO, the Christian conservation FBO. In some ways, the distinction can be summed up by secular conservationists themselves. In the classic essay, The Death of Environmentalism, Michael Schellenberger and Ted Nordhaus write, speaking about the myopia of environmentalists to the underlying problem of the environmental crisis, they say, what the environmental movement needs more than anything else right now is to take a collective step back and rethink everything. We will never be able to turn things around as long as we understand our failures as essentially tactical and make proposals that are essentially technical. That kind of short-sightedness isn't just ineffective. Sometimes it's just stupid. Martin Palmer, 
of the World Bank relates an example that shows just how stupid it can be. He writes, I was recently, several years ago, shown a copy of a proposal drawn up by a very respectable international environmental group. It was a plan based on the knowledge that the gases emitted by, the, by cattle can contribute to global warming. The proposal was to persuade nomadic people in the Central Asian steppes to agree to have their herds of cattle killed, and in return for having their traditional way of life trashed in the name of preventing global warming, the nomads were to be offered solar-powered TV sets by the environmental group. Now, somebody in this organization must have thought there was no real problem with treating these nomads as a means to a desired environmental end. But these were not just any people. These were poor people. And who, in their poverty, might be people particularly vulnerable to this kind of shameless bribery and manipulation. To the credit of the World Bank, the proposal was not funded. The philosopher Immanuel Kant wrote, in the realm of ends, everything has either a price or a dignity. Whatever has a price can be replaced by something else as its equivalent. On the other hand, whatever is above all price and therefore admits no equivalent has dignity. And out of that conviction, Kant arrives at one of his most important ethical principles, that rational human beings as individuals have no equivalent. They can never and should never be treated as means to an end, but always be treated as ends in themselves. Not only have secular conservation organizations focused overmuch on technical and tactical dimensions of the conservation problem, and in that often treated people outside their own circle as a means to an end, rather than as individuals who were ends in themselves, this is also a problem that plagues conservation efforts throughout the world. One solution might be to have the executives of all the conservation NGOs read Kant. Let's consider a more serious practical solution, an alternative perception of the problem and what to do about it. In the 1980s, a young British pastor, Peter Harris, and his wife, Miranda, were leading a small and struggling church in England's Merseyside district of Liverpool. Peter Harris, who was formerly educated and trained as a pastor, was also a very avid and very skilled amateur ornithologist. He spent most of his days off watching and photographing birds on the River Mercy and other local areas. His attention to birds in the midst of his pastoral duties sometimes produced comic conflicts. He tells the story of visiting one elderly homebound lady who was part of his church. Harris was trying to encourage and cheer her and recounts, we were deep in conversation. When my eyes strayed to the lawn that was visible over her left shoulder and I noticed a brambling feeding among the customary flock of chaffinches. Very few bramblings had been seen in the area that winter, but I suspected that she wouldn't feel quite the consolation she was looking for if I said, cheer up, there's a brambling on your lawn. That wasn't one of the recognized punchlines in the counseling manuals we had been given at Theological College. Now, let's agree with Harris, no, it wasn't. But increasingly, through events in their lives, encouragement from friends and colleagues, the Harrises began to envision a Christian field study center dedicated to the study of God's creation and in that work to make a proclamation and a manifestation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Improbable as it seemed, it actually gained the support of a group that was then called the Bible Churchmen's Missionary Society. Today that's Crosslinks. And in 1982, a small trust fund was founded to support the Harris's work. The Harrises worked diligently for the preservation of unique wetlands in Portugal where they were living and did that in a surrounding culture that was losing touch with the beauty and value of its own environment. 
But the Harrises were also missionaries in the fullest sense. They were laboring to establish a transformed human community, a community of people that would be marked by reconciliation to one another and to their surrounding creation. In both efforts, they achieved remarkable success. Today, the Harris's initial effort in Portugal, which came to be called Arasha, which is Portuguese for the rock, now has chapters in 19 countries. Emphasis on human community, cultural transformation, are integral parts of their efforts, exemplified in two ways. First, their ability to bring people together from all over the world, active in conservation, who were Christians, but who did not know one another. Now they do. And all these people may be certainly unfamiliar to any of us here. Some of them include some of the most famous and distinguished conservation biologists in the world. They are gathered here in Portugal at one of the early conferences for Arasha. The Harrises also achieved real work and accomplishment in conservation. In Lebanon, the politically unstable climate where most conservationists don't have much hope of achieving anything, they were able to successfully preserve the Amik wetland, the last major wetland area in the bridge between Europe and Asia. Arasha Lebanon leaders accomplished this not through legislation, but because they were able to introduce local farmers to improve management techniques that reduce the amount of water being pumped out of the wetland, that shifted their own crops to less moisture dependent plants, and the effect of these changes was dramatic. And the wetland began to recover far more quickly than anyone had imagined. And that, by the way, is Mount Hermon in the background. The Arasha members documented the enormous biodiversity of the wetland the species of rare birds and mammals, reptiles and amphibians. They brought national and international attention to the site. By 1999, the Amik wetland, through Arash's efforts, had been declared an official Ramsar site under the provisions of the major international wetland treaty, given official status and protection. In 2005, it was designated an official biosphere reserve by the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. Now, Abi Yuan, that scholar back at USC, writing about FBOs, notes that they're not equally effective in every part of the world, but they tend to be especially effective in places where a sense of cynicism and distrust toward the government prevail. Such places have come to see the church and the various faith-based initiatives connected with it assume a leadership role that entails not only guiding the citizenry toward peace and order, but providing them with the social services they need. In the midst of all this, the church and faith-based NGOs, that's the FBOs, have managed to maintain their credibility and independence, valuable traits in places where government institutions are wrought with corruption mismanagement, and bureaucracy. Now, most secular conservation NGOs perceive problems in conservation as problems of cost and benefits solved by welfare maximization strategies. Christian FBOs see the problems as conflicts between consumption and conscience a problem that can only be solved by having people distinguish between different kinds of desires, desires we ought to have and desires we actually have. Desires we have for using the environment and its goods, sometimes at the expense of our neighbors, and desires we ought to have for serving and protecting it and seeing to the needs of our neighbors. Now that problem is a freedom of will and I addressed that briefly in chapel this morning. It has profound implications for priorities in conservation. As Peter Harris, who founded Arosha, put it, the fractured relationship between people and places 
has often been the most significant factor in their degradation. Many conservation initiatives throughout the world have failed because they did not understand what people want to address first before anything else is this question. Will we be able to continue our way of life? Will our culture be preserved? Deep in the tropical forest of Papua New Guinea, the Evangelical Alliance, a Christian missionary organization, constructed a new center for its work in 2001. On its face, that's hardly news. What's significant about this construction, the Hogave Conference and Retreat Center, which you see here, is that the center is not primarily a center for evangelism or theological education or organizational management. The Hogave Conservation and Retreat Center is dedicated to training Christian pastors and laity in the principles and practice of forest management. The Hogave Center is located in the middle of a large and important nature reserve, which was established by three clans of indigenous people, all Christians, who united their holdings in order to form the reserve and protect the forest that had always been their home. The Hogabi Center is a success story, but to understand success, sometimes you have to contrast it with failure. So let me do that with a different story. During the last 30 years, the coastline of Lebanon has experienced rapid development. Its shorelines, its hills have been converted from natural areas to roads, homes, and business centers. But these are the same shorelines and the same hillsides that were the home of the famed cedars of Lebanon, forests of massive and ancient trees unique in the Mediterranean world. Most of these forests had been destroyed by the time the conservation community realized the gravity of the situation. So UNEP, the United Nations Environmental Program, and other conservation NGOs identified these Mediterranean forests as a conservation priority, ranking them among the 200 most important ecosystems to be protected worldwide. But the question was, were any left? Upon investigation, the answer turned out to be yes. A sizable ancient forest covering three hills, locally known as the Forest of Harissa, was found north of Beirut. But who owned it? The owner turned out to be a church, the Maronite Church of Lebanon, which had held title to this forest for many years. To the church, this forest was not the Forest of Harissa. It was the Holy Forest of Our Lady of Lebanon. In the center of the forest was the Cathedral of Our Lady, and with that, an enormous outdoor statue of the Virgin Mary. UNEP prepared a 48-page proposal, and they delivered it to the church. The proposal demanded a promise to abide by national and international laws to ensure the protection of the forest. The authors of the proposal put it this way, the area's custodians, meaning the church, must have protection of biodiversity as a first order management objective. If other objectives take precedence over biodiversity protection, then the area as a whole or those parts of the area where other objectives take precedence should not be classified as a protected area. Presented with the idea that protecting biodiversity was an ultimatum delivered by outside interests who possess neither sympathy nor understanding for the church's work and mission, the Maronite Church declined to enroll the forest as an area of protection. Given the failure of that effort, two other organizations, the ARC, ARC, the Alliance for Religion and Conservation, and the World Wildlife Fund tried a different tack. Working with local groups and with the patriarch of the church, they crafted a different statement. And the reasons for that protection in the new statement were written primarily by the patriarch. And he expressed the need to protect the forest this way. For centuries, the church has defended the natural beauty and godliness of the forest and hills of Harissa. 
as well as many other holy places in Lebanon. In doing so, we observe that the land and the flora and fauna on it do not ultimately belong to us. We are simply guardians of what belongs to God. In protecting this area, the church will continue to ensure the diversity of plants, trees, animals, and birds given by God, nurtured by the church, and they will be maintained. Today, the Maronite Church has created an ecology center for young people within the forest. They've formerly protected two other woodland sites. They've developed a program of environmental education and activism in 77 Lebanese villages and towns, which makes them the largest and the most effective environmental organization in Lebanon. Now, Abba Yuan would take this an example of her basic thesis, what she calls the culture of rationality in secular conservation organizations motivates their need to develop solutions that are based on technical expertise with measurable indices. What she calls the culture of hope is intrinsic to Christian environmental organizations who support a faith that believes their actions will in the end really matter and that preserves their members from cynicism and despair. And because they approach this from these different faith perspectives, they analyze problems in very different ways. In fact, they would organize them something like this. The traditional conservation NGO typically perceives the conservation problem to be bad environmental management. In other words, the problem is tactical. And the perceived solution is to provide better information. The solution is technical. Typically, Christian conservation FBOs perceive the problem as a lack of reconciliation, strife between human and non-human purposes in the local environment. Their goal and their approach to the solution is to change what they would call cognitive emphases and relational mechanisms. Now what we mean by that, cognitive emphases refer to how people alter their identities, their interests, and their possibilities for change. Relational mechanisms affect the connections among the people and their culture and their environment in ways that enable them to cause such change. And finally, environmental mechanisms provide external factors that affect people's capacities to affect that change. Christian FBOs change the cognition of human beings toward the environment because they replace the concept of ruling nature through domination by the concept of ruling nature through service. They change the perception of possibilities for change by teaching people to see themselves as authorized and empowered agents of God responsible for the creation around them. They change the relational structures of people with one another Human opponents of one position or another, even if identified as enemies of the interests of the FBO, are to be treated with love, concern, and respect. Disagreements are real, but the goal is not to dominate the other through political, social, or economic power, but to work to reconcile interest with others through deliberation and mutual respect. Conservation success is then not pursued as the spoils of a war in which the political victors have outvoted, outwitted, or outspent their opposition. It's pursued as the fruit of humble and persistent efforts to love one's neighbor, to serve and protect creation. Now, hopelessly <coughs> idyllic as this approach may appear, it has a growing record of success. On this point, 
the objections you would raise to Christian FBOs would be remarkably parable, uh, parallel excuse me, to the objections you would raise to Christian faith in general. In the calculus of worldly wisdom, you cannot be expected to get along by loving your enemies, by working for reconciliation instead of controlling domination, by inspecting, expecting big returns from small investments simply because you buttress them with faith and prayer. But that description of the Christian FBO's strategy and conservation is, at its best, simply a particular illustration of the history of Christian faith in the world. That faith, also illogical as it might seem an argument, provides proof of its effect through the witness of history. It has shown itself to be an approach that can change the world and the people in it, and it has. I ended with this picture not simply for its scenic value. This is a watercolor by America's most famous watercolor artist, Thomas Moran, who accompanied the Yellowstone expedition and made beautiful watercolors of it. This picture is called The Mountain of the Holy Cross. You may not notice the Holy Cross right away. It is two perpendicular stars on that mountain far in the distance which are filled with snow. It is an aspiration to something initially far beyond our reach, but nevertheless very present and visible to our senses. That has been the Christian practice and the Christian tradition of conservation in the world today. Thank you. We have a few moments if there are questions. Yes, sir. If a student wanted to get involved in this, what kinds of organizations and or activities would you recommend? Well, I'll get right to it. There's, uh, <laughs> There's an Arasha USA, uh, and there are also Arasha student chapters at some different colleges. So you could join Arasha USA and immediately get involved in their issues, or if you're a real entrepreneur and want to start one yourself, you could start the Roberts, uh, uh, the Roberts uh, Wesleyan College chapter of Arosha. We started the very first one at Wheaton College. And apparently it was good training for leadership because the, the first president of Arasha Wheaton, Ben Lowe, uh, went from there and founded his own NGO, uh, which was um, Renewal. And after that, he ran for Congress. He lost, but he was able to get 65,000 votes on a $64,000 budget, which if you look at modern presidential ratios, that's a miracle. Uh, ben is now the chair of the Asable Institute Board of Directors. Uh, the other thing you could do if you want skills that will enable you to do good, and pardon me if this sounds self-serving, but it's true nevertheless, you could take a course at the Asabo Institute. Actually, you could take more than one. You could take two or three or four. You could learn how to establish hygienic water systems for people in developing countries. You could learn how to restore degraded habitats. You could learn how to develop a system of ecological agriculture. You could go to Costa Rica and learn how these skills are actually applied in a missionary setting. Those are some things you could do. You could join the Evangelical Environmental Network's uh, Young Adult Program, which actually Ben Lowe also leads, uh, which will engage you with a network of people college students mainly all around the country and the work that they are doing in areas where their engagement makes uh, a difference. So the list could go on, but I, I shouldn't. So those are some of the things you could do. Yes, sir. How many, uh, to your knowledge, denominations and parachurch mission organizations have structurally That, that's a tough question because it keeps increasing. The last time I took a count, there were over 40 
explicitly Christian organizations with explicitly environmental missions. I guess I think it's existing organizations that... And then, then that's not the whole list. Yeah. Because in addition to these mostly newer organizations, which have now focused on an environmental ministry, a lot of the older traditional missionary organizations have included environmental work in their mission. For example, World Vision had a major celebration in 2009 in Ethiopia to celebrate their work in revegetating the Humbo region for the Humbo farmers that they were working with in a missions effort. But this was mainly an environmental work of revegetation and protecting the area from soil erosion so the farmers could grow crops on that. So it's very difficult to give you a total. I would say it's probably now over 50 uh, organizations with specifically stated environmental missions that are Christian, and then there's probably at least that number of older organizations that have added some kind of environmental unit uh, to their work to look specifically at environmental concerns because of the way it affects their mission work. And, and you were thinking of which ones uh, to, to get involved in, or? And how about denominations? Denominations. Most Protestant denominations now have at least one major statement on the environment. And out of that, most of them now have some kind of standing committee or task force to address the issues. The Catholic Church, uh, through um, its major development organizations now also has a major environmental thrust and forgive me right at the moment it's going to oh codell uh codell uh and i forget what that acronym stands for is the major catholic development organization and they have uh, a major environmental thrust in a lot of their development work Well, in one sense, uh, God in his providence, knowing that we are often, as humans, not smart enough to make good priority list, has in part dealt with the problem by giving a lot of these organizations fairly specific ministries. In other words, they don't attack everything. Uh, each one of them often has particular <coughs> conservation targets. And in addition to that, a lot of these uh, conservation FBOs, because they are concerned with local communities, aren't that concerned about making global priorities. They tend to address the local and immediate need. But on the other hand, I'm, I'm not gonna dodge the question. There are some uh, Christian FBOs that do have enough influence and enough reach that they have made those decisions. And most of them at this point, for example, the EEM, uh, Arasha to some extent, have begun to focus most of their energies, their priority energies, on the issues of global climate change. And I think that is a wise decision because climate change is an environmental driver that if you don't address it and you don't develop mitigation strategies for it, it will override every other kind of conservation effort you try to do. If you set your boundaries for a conservation reserve at one place and the climate changes and the habitats change with it so that the biomes you're trying to protect move north, your preserve is no longer preserving anything. So you have to develop a refuge strategy that takes that into account. Now, secular organizations are already getting onto that. For example, Parks Canada, which is experiencing massive effects of climate change on their national parks, 
have developed a major climate change strategy to mitigate that and actually to even change the borders of their parks in order to protect the ecosystems that they were chartered by their government to protect. So I would say if, if, we, if we must name one thing, uh, it would be, and right now is, being addressed by groups like the EEN, uh, the issue of climate change. But the fact is that in real life, you really do often have to chew gum and bounce the ball at the same time, even though I was never very good at it. You often have to address and attack multiple priorities as God gives you the resources and the expertise to do it. So the priority lists are helpful, but very often uh, you find that your real opportunity to change things may be different from the priority list that you made. Is there much interface with the, uh, the uh, conservation movement and environmental justice issues and the environmental justice movement in general? They're, they're very close. For example, again, the EEN was a major player in this. The, the recent uh, legislation that was enacted to uh, limit uh, mercury uh, had some very important environmental justice implications because the sources of the mercury pollution, which were often coal plants, were often located in disproportionately poor and minority neighborhoods. That was a major fight. Uh, but the EEM framed that legislation as a pro-life issue because we are now to the point that 16% or one in six pregnant women has an unborn child exposed to levels of mercury that the EPA considers unsafe. Uh, had that legislation failed, it actually was a challenge uh, to the EPA's authority to regulate mercury, which is the way it played out in the, in the Congress, had that failed uh, and that not been regulated, then those, that mercury contamination would have disproportionately affected and placed at risk uh, minority and, and more impoverished communities as well as uh, unborn children. There are many other examples, but that, that's the most recent one. Um, going back to what you said about That's a very good question. And because climate change is global, uh, the individual things we do, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, may not, in terms of our own sphere of influence, have a, an immediate global impact. What you want to do as an individual is live with integrity. That is, you want to live in a way that's congruent with what you say you believe. So, the way you would do this analytically, and there are some websites that will help you do it, is first of all, you can evaluate your climate footprint. And you do that by cataloging your activities, you know, which have to do with what you eat, uh, how you get around, what you use for transportation, how you eat your home or don't eat your home, uh, things of that nature. And in those analyses, you can see what are the areas where my own personal choices and activities contribute the most to the carbon emissions I'm responsible for. And then you can ask, can I reduce these? Now sometimes uh, the answer is no, uh, unless I you know, leave school or, or make a major change in my life or something like that. But in many cases the answer is yes, here are some specific things I can do. Now the things that are starting to really matter, that, that really start to have a larger effect, are groups of people getting together often in local governments or urban governments and forming coalitions to make changes, which allows you to bypass, if you will, the political debate, which is stalled and not going anywhere, get around the, the stalled legislation and start to form alliances and, and congruences with other groups to do cooperative efforts that will change uh, the way that's done. But I would be very much amiss, and I think God would be very displeased if I, I didn't remember and remind myself and you that as Tennyson said, more things are wrought 
by prayer in this world than men dream of. And to their credit, the EEM, in the second presidential debate, gathered a lot of the, the younger college-age people in the EEM outside the debate center and held a prayer vigil. They prayed during the debate that climate change would be raised, not only in the debate, but in the entire political discourse as an issue to be evaluated for action. And frankly, it's too early to say uh, whether or not those prayers are answered, but I know they intend to keep praying. So I would offer all of those uh, as ways to, to get started on that. Yeah, there are a couple of announcements, but let's thank uh, Dr. Franklin Dyke again. <laughs>